everyone and welcome to our Team Ministries online magazine for December. I'm Karen Corbett, one of the readers here in our North Meals Team Ministry. This is almost a Christmas edition, but not quite. It is though our last monthly edition of this magazine, as we announced last month. Next year we move to the magazine being available quarterly. We will announce it in good time when it is available. If you have enjoyed some of the items we have featured over the past year, the good news is that they continue to be available to watch again on our YouTube channel. Thank you. 
Throughout the year, all three of our churches support the important work of the Children's Society. But it is at Christmas that that support takes on a tangible aspect as we hold our Chris Dingle services. And it is the Chris Dingle orange itself that becomes the focus. Let's make our Chris Dingle. Who can we find to help us? We'll start with the orange. The orange represents the whole world. Next, we're going to add red tape around the middle of the orange. This represents God's love going all the way around the earth. We're going to take some sweets and put them on cup sticks. Then we're going to stick them in four points in the orange. This represents all the amazing good gifts that God has given us. We're going to carefully make a cut in the top of the orange and then we're going to place the candle in the top. The candle represents Jesus, the light of the world. And now our Chris Dingle is complete. There's a huge amount of poverty and a lot of children and young people that do have real need in the UK. I like making the Christian go because I want to help other children who are in need. Chris Dingle is such a great way to show love and support to those in need in our communities. Each month, as part of our online magazine's presentation, we try to include an interview with a local character who has an interesting story to tell, or we move out of our team ministry to meet someone in the wider church. This month, we are meeting with our Archdeacon, Pete Spears, who inevitably has some challenging things to say to us. Um, Archdeacon Pete, th thanks so much for being with us and coming on our online magazine. Pleasure. Just about now, underneath your, your name will be your title, Archdeacon, Venerable Pete Spears. That makes me most basically feel ancient. Um, just exactly where does that the title come from? Oh, I, I have no idea, have no idea where idea. the title comes from. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, it's only in um, emails or in letters that I get addressed as venerable. Um, uh, but Archdeacon is, uh, is an interesting word as well, isn't it? It is. You know, sometimes people say uh, the Archdeacon is the head on, that is the crook of the head of Bishop Staff. And, um, uh, but really, the, the job that I uh, applied for was... Uh, a job that was a bit of an agitator and reflector and someone that could work very closely with parishes in their mission and ministry and that's the side of things that I really enjoy. That's your brief. And most parishes will only see the Archdeacon when uh, there's a big occasion or something's gone wrong. <laughs> but I know there's more to the job than that. Just take us through a typical week of the life of an Archdeacon. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no typical week, Les. Um, but uh, it can be uh, doing some work on buildings, it can be pastoral with clergy, uh, or with lay people as well. Sometimes they've got church wardens in particular, they may have questions about uh, their building or a particular difficult issue in the parish. Uh, sometimes clergy and lay people want to talk to me about each other. And uh, is there any uh, mediation that, that, that might be possible? Um, uh, appointments take up a long time. There's a lot to appointments of clergy right. yeah. uh, in terms of advertising and working with parishes as they draw up their parish profile. Um, then there's diocesan responsibilities as well. So we have meetings as senior leaders uh, uh, on a fairly regular basis. We call uh, the diocesan oversight team is that, that body. We also have an appointments and wellbeing team. 
um, and also interacting with the staff at St James's House because they are also receiving inquiries from clergy and lay people and they often want to consult with me. Is that so, where you're based? Uh, yes, yeah. so I, I have an office there, although latterly I've been working a lot more from home. Um, I'm also a trustee of the Diocesan Board of Finance. So money is a really important uh, issue and a challenge, as it is for everybody um, at the moment. Uh, so that also concentrates the mind when you think the Diocesan Board of Finance, you know, are, have we got enough money coming in and are we spending it wisely and well? Uh, so that's, uh, that's a big challenge for us. I mean, one of the bugbears we often hear from other folk in the pew is Parishure. Just, just, just tell me the... So what, 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 what I like to say to people is that the bishop um, uh, is able to deploy 200 clergy in the Diocese of Liverpool. So that includes stipendiary uh, clergy in parishes, but also curates. And uh, the bishop allocates them to parishes or to deaneries in this particular case and says this is how much there's going to cost to deploy all these 200 people and asks each deanery to contribute a share of that total cost. So in North Meals, for example, uh, you will be contributing not just to the cost of your own clergy, uh, but also to the costs of the clergy around the diocese. And so in a diocese where we have some very deprived parishes, your giving uh, or paying a parish share uh, is, 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 is missional giving and is resourcing clergy in deprived parishes, which is a really cute. So it's an opportunity to say thank you to the people of uh, <laughs> North Meals for their contribution. Yeah. So you, you mentioned it's on a deanery basis. So who in the deanery makes those kind of decisions? Is it the rural, the sort of the area dean? So in the uh, in North Mills deanery, the deanery leadership team and ultimately the deanery synod right. will uh, currently there are nine clergy who are deployed. Um, as a diocese, we tell North Mills deanery how much that will cost, and then it's divided up by a formula amongst yourselves. And deaneries can either use the diocesan formula, which used attendance and deprivation, or then come up with their own, own formula. Obviously, everybody wants to pay less parish share. Yeah. But I've just come back from Ghana, Les, and in, in Ghana, they love to give. And I went to a service and there were, the collections took 40 minutes. Wow. And uh, they had three collections. And in the first collection, as you came forward with your gift, they called out your name and how much you would give. Wow. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, there aren't many churches in the Diocese of Liverpool or the Church of England where that kind of uh, uh, practice would happen. But they just love to give. And I, and I, and I grieves me when uh, it, it, it's right that we're good stewards of our money. But I would love us in this country to have a different attitude to giving. It, it can't all be work, um, and rightly so. So tell us... You both about your own interests, your hobbies that you follow, how work? Well, I'm a big fan of Liverpool Football Club, so um, I try to watch as many games as I can. Unfortunately, I don't go to the game, but when I say watch, I mean on, on TV. Uh, and a group, of, a group of us, we watch it together, um, and uh, we often do that via WhatsApp. So they're all in each other's homes, and we're commenting on each other. So I enjoy those games. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I started researching my family history, mm. and um, uh, I've, you know that's been fascinating. So obviously, myself uh, and Annie's my wife, her her family, and uh, Annie's family are very illustrious, and they go back a very long way. And uh, she's a direct descendant of William the Conqueror, for example. <laughs> wow. And uh, so uh, lots of people might be able to claim that. But uh, that's what I've been able to, uh, to find out. And um, so whenever I get a spare half hour or hour, uh, that's the sort of thing that I will do. Um, uh, so I think those, those are the you know, big things. Quite time consuming is so funny. They can be, yes. And obviously Liverpool's games, they're often midweek and a weekend, so I have to try and make my other commitments fit around them. <laughs> your diary around them, yeah. For me, one of the best ways of picturing our, um, our Christian life is as a journey, a journey of faith. 
T tell us a bit about your journey and along the way, have you had any individual who's been an influence to you or, or something that's happened that has really changed your direction? Well, I was born into a Christian family. My dad was a vicar and actually an archdeacon as well in the diocese. Um, and uh, so I was brought up to go to church. Uh, but I'd have to say that I, uh, it was only when I went to university and met other uh, people of my age that I realised that they had a quality of their Christian life which I just didn't have. So I'd go to church and I, I would know stuff about church. But the people that I were meeting, my fellow students, they had a, a depth, a, a love, a peace, which I just didn't experience. And part of that was bound up with my disability because I was born affected by thalidomide. And uh, I think, uh, you know, during the teenage years, they were quite tough and challenging. I went away to university and I suddenly realised that uh, I was different to everybody else. And I really craved what uh, these other Christians had. And um, so I can still remember now uh, uh, a, a student in the third year, I was in the first year at the time, Judy, uh, who was a Christian, uh, knocking on my door and saying, Pete, I'm going to this Christian evangelistic event. Would you like to come as well? And those of people who know me knew I didn't do a lot of academic work at university. And I had something to be handed in the next day and I thought, you know what, I'd much rather go to this evangelistic talk. Yeah. So I went to this evangelistic talk and during that talk, uh, everything fell into place for me. So for example, uh, I realised that I felt really sorry for myself because of my disability, but realised that actually if anyone should have felt sorry for themselves, it should have been Jesus, because he'd done nothing wrong and yet he was crucified. And uh, I thought that God could not love me and yet, if anyone should have felt that, Jesus himself, who uh, went to the cross and accepted the cross. And uh, I felt as though during that, that moment, that, during that talk, uh, Jesus was saying, I love you this much, was holding his hands out on the cross. Uh, and uh, I've always loved you, uh, right from the moment you were in your mother's womb. And uh, that I can use you and I will use you if only you accept the love that I have for you and accept I died for you. And so that's the night I believe that my journey into the Christian life took a massive step forward. And that's the night I say I became a Christian. And that was uh, 42 years ago uh, in February. And uh, so, and I've been trying to follow him uh, and serve him and respond to his call. Um, I think the other part of your question was uh, the biggest influence in my life. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm going to say it's my wife, Annie. Uh, Annie's been a Christian nearly all her life. Um, and I think it was by the age of three or four that she prayed a prayer in her home. Mm. And uh, I met her through university. And uh, she's always inspired me. Uh, when we got married, uh, her vicar described her as a soldier for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely say that in a really good way. She is very energetic, very, uh, very disciplined. Uh, she's put up with a lot of difficulties, not least being married to me. Uh, we brought up four children together. Uh, we've had some great trips abroad. She does amazing stuff with In Another Place. Uh, she put on a, a nativity play on the beach in our first year at Crosby and has done Narnia. Uh, performances at George's Hall and thousands of people have come to it so uh, it may not be very original but Annie has been a big influence on my life. Well that's, that's refreshing to hear that a wife or oh, your wife is, is that kind of influence and power in your life. I mean in a way you anticipated my next question which was about your disability. I, I know you're comfortable talking about it uh, and, and in a way you, you have expressed something of the question I was going to ask and, Along the way there, have you ever felt resentful about it? You, you seem to have some anger about it. Is that so? Yeah, yeah I remember when I was in my, uh, my, well it was then O-level year, GCSE year, year 11, whatever you want to say. Um, the, uh, my, my form master came in and talked about the three Bs. Birds, booze and bikes. And he <laughs> warned us all off them all, all. 
and um, but, <laughs> but I realised then that uh, uh, probably no one would ever want to go out with me. That I'd probably never get served underage in a pub, and I certainly wouldn't be riding a motorbike anytime soon. So in a way, you know, that reminded me of how different I was. That wasn't his intention, obviously. No, no. And I think that uh, yes, for a while during my teenage years, I was feeling very resentful and ultimately angry to God, but just as I said, being feeling sorry for myself. Um, and uh, even now, there are you know, it just takes. It's a bit harder to do things. It's a bit more effort for me to do things. Um, I try not to let it stop me. Uh, but in your when you get really tired, you kind of oh, if only. Um, but I think that to a certain extent, uh, I've received a healing and holders uh, because physically I'm not uh, any better. I still have short arms. Uh, but uh, I think it's the way that I think about life and the way I think that God thinks about me um, that has been difficult. I mean, we all have times when we feel sorry for ourselves. Yes. Um, but uh, the vast majority of the time, I don't. And I think in another sort of way, I've come to see that God uh, can use me as I am uh, with my disability, with the things that I find difficult. Um, and that can be an encouragement to other people who yeah, find things indeed, difficult. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Inspiration to others. Yeah, because you have overcome that, haven't you, in many, many ways. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all getting older. So uh, how much of the aches and pains I feel now is just Quite. the age <laughs> or my disability? But, you know, by and large, I enjoy good health and, mm. you know, I can do lots of things. So, mm. uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. Let's move away now from, from, from the personal. Thank you for sharing those very personal things with us. Um, let's move now to think about the church. And um, two, two questions, really, both the same. What do you think is the biggest issue or challenge facing the local church? And then the same question in terms of the national church. I think um, I think they're the same actually. I think that uh, as a church we need to come what we what we we need to become what we uh, we talk about to become younger and more diverse. We need to be reaching uh, the younger generation and we need to re reach people who are not like ourselves. And that's really quite hard to do. Uh, we know that the average age of the uh, Church of England uh, attendant is 20 years uh, more than the average age of the person living in England. And so that's quite a challenge. So if most of us are over 60 and the average age is 40 in our country, you can see the challenge that we've got. I have a real passion for children and young people. And it's my, my underlying theory that the reason we don't have children and young people in our congregations by and large is because we don't have their parents. If we had their parents they would bring their children and young people with them. So how we engage with that generation and of course if we don't then we're going to lose touch with generations below them. So I believe that, you know, that God loves everybody in our, in our parish. Uh, we're reaching about 1% of our parish at the moment. Uh, if that and so the you know how do we reach the 99 percent and that's the challenge i think also we need to be able to you know we've got to get away from the idea that the clergy uh are particularly gifted or suited at doing this we've all got a part to play in that we've all got friends we've all got family we've all got neighbors we've all got work colleagues uh how are we being equipped and how are we sharing the good news of God's love with those people in, that, in those situations. You're suggesting something needing really radical in the mindset of the people in the pew. That is not an easy thing to achieve. No. How, how, I mean, I'm asking you a very difficult question. <laughs> how, how is that possible? Well, <laughs> well, well, it takes a long time, as you say, and part of it's a cultural change, Les. Uh, the, the diocese spent uh, a lot of 2020 and the early part of 2021 uh, consulting with loads of people, um, uh, uh, clergy and lay, uh, about what, how we're going to face the challenges facing us. And we've come up with um, a thing called Fit for Mission, 
and mm. we've asked the church commissioners if they'll back it and the church commissioners have said they will do and what fit for mission essentially is is a change program on lots of different levels uh, uh, but setting out as its priorities introducing more people to jesus deepening discipleship uh, in people who are already disciples raising up new christian leaders lay and ordained and more social action more connection with our communities and in order to do that we're going to have coaches who will coach people in different ways of working we'll need to do pastoral reorganization so that we have um, fewer people involved in meetings uh, i know people say that they don't love meeting that they they don't love meetings but if you try to take a meeting away from them they get really upset so we're talking about larger parishes um, uh, i'm aware here there are three pcc's that uh, rebecca will go to well what would it look like if there was only one uh, it would look very different but uh, we think we need to have larger parishes so uh, based on the deanery so at the moment every parish is in a deanery and we say that we have a deanery wide focus but in practice we just really look at our own parish and our own church even and we need to change that mindset and so uh, that's a cultural change i call it we talk about it takes 10 years to do that um, so we've been starting doing that already but it's taking a long time to get through the the challenge is that if we have less money uh, coming in then we will have less options as to what we do in the future so although we're talking about it now while we're, we're just about okay i think the the future is going to hit us very soon unless we unless we change sooner rather than later so that's the particular challenge that's the agitator and reflect a bit yeah. of my role yeah. when i go and talk to a pcc these are the kind of the conversations that i'm having with people are people wanting to hear those things no they're not no. they're not uh, because most in my experience most pccs uh, where there is no financial problem uh, will say well we're we know we're keeping the show on the road archdeacon and they go great they may not be growing but they're keeping the show on the road but in uh, three or four years they may not be able to do that any longer so what i'm wanting to do is to get out, out ahead of that but it's hard for people to see that if they don't understand what the problem is. Uh, but as I look across the diocese, I can see what the problem is. And I guess um, I'm obviously not uh, succeeding in my job if I can't make other people see. But that, those are the kind of conversations we need to be having. So really, you've anticipated my final question, which is looking forward, as, as we've just started to do, uh, how do you see the shape of the church, perhaps the, ch the Church of England certainly, say in 25, 30 years time, uh, when <laughs> it will be perhaps very different? Well, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would love to see, uh, we, we talk in the diocese about more people knowing Jesus and uh, more justice in the world. I'd love to see that. Uh, I would love to see the church being younger. I'd love to see more congregations meeting not necessarily more churches but more congregations meeting on sundays midweek we might be sharing buildings but we might be uh reaching the demographic that we need to reach that we haven't so i would uh, i'd like to i think that we're going to see different roles that for clergy and lay people um uh, I'm, you know i think uh so i see uh uh I see a, a diversity, a vitality in our church. That's what I hope. Um, uh, but the decisions we make today will affect that future in 25 years' time. So when I go to a PCC meeting about a PCC members uh, offer, need to offer foresight. Where are they going to be in 25 years' time? Um, and that it's it, it's predicated on the question if current trends continue where are we going to be in 25 years time if the membership continues to get older and older and i'm not i'm not you know i love older people so i'm not an anti-old person thing We're nearly there ourselves <laughs> if, if we're getting older and older and no one is coming in at the younger end there is not going to be a church uh, i think god is in his church 
God grows the church, so we need to listen to God and we need to ask God and we need to depend on him. And we need to say, God, what are you telling us right now? Uh, so that we listen not to, to, not to me, but to what God is saying. Yeah, difficult, difficult things, aren't they? But that's the job of the Archdeacon, isn't it? Saying difficult things, saying challenging things, which you've done today. <laughs> so thanks so much, Pete, for being with us and sharing these things. We really, I'm sure it will bring many thoughts to many people and bring, bring many challenges too. And if, if uh, well, thank you, Les, for you, what you've done today and for your ministry. I know how much is appreciated. Uh, and of course, if that leads, if it leads to a, an invitation to the next PCC meeting, <laughs> then I'll be very happy to come along and talk. I'll leave, I'll leave that with the rector. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pete, very much indeed. Where do you go for your shopping? If it is a big shop, you may well spend an hour or two in one of the super-sized supermarkets such as Tesco or Morrison's. But if it is that you just want a few items, you may well drop into your local co-op store locally. Of course, we have a choice of a co-op in File Road and near the lights at Churchtown. The village of Banks is now boasting a brand new co-op. There has been a co-op store in the village of Banks for as long as most people can remember. In recent years the village has grown significantly and the long-standing store was proving too small and lacking adequate parking space. And so it was that a year or two ago a planning application was submitted and accepted for a new store to be built. It will be sited on the area of land occupied by the former village pub the new Fleetwood, which the owners accepted was no longer profitable and would now be demolished. It has taken some time, but the new co-op building is now built and has opened in time to benefit from the Christmas trade. Over this past year or so, Kenneth Warbank has been keeping a watchful eye on the building as it progressed. He has produced a video diary for our magazine and we are able to see how a new landmark has appeared just opposite St Stephen's Church.
Now we return to our preparations for Christmas as we hear this month's Christian Reflection brought to us by the Rector, Rebecca. The Christmas story is a wonderful story, almost magical. We are taken out of the ordinary events of life. We find ourselves engulfed in the story of Mary and Joseph, shepherds, angels and a tiny baby. It's almost as if heaven and earth meet together. The thin veil between the two is gently lifted and we catch a glimpse of the glory of heaven. It is the glory of the angels visiting shepherds, the outcasts of society, and bringing to them the news of the birth of a child, the saviour of the world. And in their coming they burst into song, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace amongst those whom he favours. They are full of joy, full of the glory of the Lord. Their song a song of peace, their news the greatest news of all. To you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is the Messiah, the Lord. The song of peace, the news of the birth of the Messiah, is not just for the shepherds, but for the whole of humankind. The song and the news are once again desperately needed to be heard in our world today. For the world that Jesus was born into was one very similar to us. There was war, famine, poverty, great need. In our world, we too see and experience such things. We, say we see great suffering in countries like Ukraine and also still in Syria and indeed Afghanistan. There seems very little difference between our worlds and yet it is for in the coming of this baby, fully God and fully man, born not into a comfortable home, but into a grubby, dirty stable and placed not in a nice cot but in the animal trough, the very place where the animals ate the food. It is this baby, Jesus Christ, who has changed everything, even in the midst of our world's suffering. For now, our redemption, yours and mine, is assured. Now, hope lives on. Now love comes into its own. The redemption, hope and love of God is ever present, even when we don't feel it, even when we don't recognise it. The Christmas story reminds us that God has not abandoned us to the brokenness that we, humanity, have created. No, he calls us by name to turn to follow him to find in him the peace, the love, the quiet joy he offers. For Jesus Christ is the greatest gift of Christmas, and it is a gift offered to all, the poor, the rich, the marginalised, the ordinary folk. It is the gift that God offers to you and I again this Christmas. It is up to us to take it, to share it with each other, and to share the wonderful news of the coming of the Saviour with the whole world. I'd like to finish this short reflection with the words of a wonderful Christmas blessing. So may the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas and for evermore. Amen.
And so, as we come to the end of this month's online magazine, we would like to extend an invitation to you to join us at one of our church services over the Christmas period. As you will see from the information that follows, there is something for everyone and all ages. May God give you and your family a sense of his peace, his joy and his blessing as we celebrate the coming of God's Son, Jesus, in that stable at Bethlehem. <laughs>